Hola, this is Enrique Morones of Magnificent Mujer, and we have another podcast this wonderful Tuesday. And as always, we have a magnificent mujer to hear from. And one magnificent mujer, Sarah Bella, is our producer, and thanks to her, we're able to do these podcasts. I don't think I give her enough credit, so I want to make sure I recognize that. And uh, we've been doing this since Cesar Chavez Day on March 31st. And we come out on Tuesdays, 3 o'clock, Buen Hombre, Magnificent Mujer. And this particular Magnificent Mujer is a young lady that I met like a lot of people met. I saw her picture in the San Diego Union Tribune on the cover. And as soon as I said I saw it, my eyes teared up and I immediately knew what it meant. I didn't know the whole story, but I knew part of the story because I had been in that same place and I had worked with that same community many, many years ago, in 1986, when I first started Border Angels, by going into the canyons of Carlsbad and working with the migrant community that lived in the canyons. And thanks to them, we have food on our tables, the strawberries, the tomatoes, etc. So when I saw that picture, I contacted the paper and I said, I need to talk to that young lady. So they gave me her contact information. And that young lady is one of my sheroes a magnificent mujer, and her name is Erika Alfaro. Erika, como estas? How are you doing? Hi, Enrique. Hola. I'm doing good. Thank you so much for the beautiful introduction. Oh, you're welcome. I almost, I almost forgot. And she's part of the Gente Unida Board of Directors as well. So, Erika, one of the things that I do way back before you were even born, when I used to have a radio show and, and now it's a podcast, is the first question besides how you doing is, for the person to kind of tell us a little bit about themselves in their own words. So, Erika, why don't you tell us who is Erika Alfaro? Yes. Uh, Erika, yo, I am the proud daughter of migrant farm workers. I am the first one in my family to receive a master's degree. And like you said, my pictures went viral after I share my graduation pictures. The pictures where I'm standing in the fruit fields with my parents wearing my cap and gown. Those pictures became international news and that is how my story came out to the public. And I am a person that has always been inspired, like my main goal is to inspire underrepresented students to continue with their education. And that is the main reason why I decided to share my story. And uh, now I am a keynote speaker, a business owner, and I'm also working on my book and doing other things for our community. You're doing a lot of things for the community, Eddie, and, I, and I'm still looking forward to meeting your parents. I had the honor of meeting your husband and mm -hmm. meeting you, and, uh, and I invited you to be the keynote speaker at another organization that I also founded called the House of Mexico, and we had our, aunt, we had our, our big dinner this past November, and everybody that was there including a large group from San Diego State University where you received your master's, was so impressed and they were so uh, looking forward to meeting you uh, because you're uh, you know, very well-spoken, you're very inspirational, and you've got quite a story. So we're honored to have you on, on Magnificent Mujer. And for people that don't know, uh, that picture of you in your graduation gown with your parents right next to you in the star mm -hmm. strawberry fields of San Diego of Carlsbad up in North County, was was viral and it went around the world were you shocked when you saw the reaction that you were getting because of that picture yes i honestly i never i never thought that the pictures were gonna like i wasn't expecting for the pictures to go viral and like i said i always wanted to share my story and i used to tell myself that if i, if I can at least share my story with one person and inspire one person then that means that everything that i went through was worth it and after the when the pictures went viral my only my story was not only shared in my community but all over the world and that is something that i never expected i i always thought that one day i was going to share my story maybe in one classroom and inspire one person uh but i it was totally unexpected i, I never i never thought that my pictures were going to go viral yes yeah, quite a picture and not, not only is it quite a picture but why don't you tell us the simple uh, story about the photographer? Because not only the picture, but how about the photographer? 
Yes, the photographer is a young man. His name is Jalil. And he started his career as a photographer. And for that reason, his prices were cheap. And coming, being a student at that moment, I, I just wanted to save some money. I hire him. He did an excellent job. Right now, he has a lot of work. He is also a Latino. And he's, he's a good friend of mine, a great photographer. And I remember when I, when I hired him, I told him that, I, that these pictures were very special for me because I wanted to thank my parents for their sacrifices. And not only did he did a great job, but he took a lot more pictures than I paid him for. And I always give him credit for his excellent job. Well, we're going to want his, either, either during the podcast or later, the contact information for the uh, photographer as well, so we could also yes. promote him. But what did yes. you tell, you said, so your story, so, so we'll, we'll get that at the end, but so, so your story, so, so what is your story? Tell us your story, your parents standing there, what's going on? What, what, I, I have an idea, but share with us what that story is. Yeah, my parents came to this country with the hope of giving us a better life. They never went to school. My parents, they don't know how to read or write. They are from Oaxaca, Mexico. And beautiful their part first of the language is beautiful part. And their first language is Mixteco. Uh, mm -hmm. So when they came to this country, they didn't even know how to speak Spanish. Uh, they didn't have any type of education, but they always had that goal of giving a better life to their kids. They always work in the fields, long hours, seven days a week, 10 hours per day, 12 hours per day, sometimes making the minimum wage, always with the hope of a better life. And thanks to my, my parents, especially my mom, uh, she took me to work in the fields where I took the pictures when I, was, when I was 14 years old during a summer. And when I told her that I was tired, she said, this is our life. If you want a better life, you need to get a good education. And I am very grateful with my parents because even though that they never went to school or that they don't have any type of um, educational background, they always knew the importance of getting a good education. A, a formal education, right. And, mm -hmm. um, and when, I, when I saw it, because I, like I told you when I met you, I started uh, my work in the, in, I never worked in the fields, but I started my work in those canyons when I heard that there was people living there, and I was so moved by those people, mainly from Oaxaca, and their uh, intelligence, their 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 love. Uh, sometimes they had families there, and it was very powerful for me uh, to to meet them, the the people that live in the canyon. Some some still do, although not as many as before. But thanks mm -hmm. to them, uh, we have, like I mentioned earlier, the food on our tables, and and we have. Um, you know, the price of the food is a lot less. So the sacrifices that they make is a universal sacrifice because everybody, every culture throughout the history of the world has worked in agriculture. Somewhere down the line in our family roots, somebody was working in agriculture, whether it was the Irish that came here or the Chinese or, or people from anywhere or people crossing from Africa to Europe, et cetera, et cetera. They work in the fields. Uh, at some time in their family history. So it's very powerful. And then here in California, which if it was a country, would be the fifth most powerful economy in the world, in the world, California, the number one industry is agriculture. And 85% of the people that work in agriculture are undocumented. And I think it's something that people often forget. But now that we have this virus and people think about the frontline workers, people in healthcare people in the stores, people that are driving, they've got to think about the people that work in the fields. Because if there's anybody that's ever been a frontline worker, it's the people that work in the fields. So your parents' values and the fact that they had you work one summer in, in when you were 14 years old, to, mm -hmm. so that way you would know. You know, if you don't want to continue with this lifestyle, you need to get an education. So how did that work? How did that work about getting a, an education? Yeah. Like you said, um, my parents are essential workers and they always showed me with that it's very important to be honest, uh, work hard and always aspire for more. And in my case, it was not easy to get a, an education, a former education, because 
I became a teenage mother. I became a mother at the age of 15. Uh, not only that, I also went through domestic abuse and I dropped out of high school when I was a freshman student, a sophomore student. I wasn't planning to go back to school, but one night my father, my baby's father forced me and my baby to sleep outside the house. And that is when I remember the memory of when my mom took me to work with her in the fields. And I remember when she, the consejo, her advice, if you want a better life, you need to get a formal education. And that is the reason why I decided to go back to school. But I, I used to think that it was impossible for a teenage mother, single mother, a person uh, that didn't know how to speak English at that moment because I came to this country when I was 13 years old. Uh, English is my second language. I struggled to learn English, but I always, I always wanted to know if someone like me existed, if it was even possible for someone like me to get a higher education. And I told myself, if you ever make it, si algún día tú lo logras, now you have to go back and help those students that are in your current situation. Uh, first generation college students, underrepresented students, teenage mothers, uh, women that went through domestic abuse. That became my main goal and that is what I'm doing right now. Um, I am trying to inspire all that population because going to back to school and being the first one in my family was not easy. In my parents, I remember that um, even though that my mom and my dad, they, they, they wanted to maybe help me with homework or go to my school meetings. I remember that my dad uh, one time went to my freshman uh, meeting in high school before I dropped out of high school. And they asked him to fill out a form and he just looked at the form. He didn't even know how to fill out the form. So he was embarrassed and he told me, I, I, don't, I don't know, but I do believe that you can, you can continue. I don't want you to drop out of high school. Um, I don't know how to help you, but that is the reason why you have to continue because you don't want to be like me. You don't want to, you don't want to struggle. And all those advices that my parents gave me are the reason why I never gave up. And also because of my son right now, my son is 14 years old and I, I just wanted a better life for him and me. And for that reason, I decided to continue and it was not easy. I was, I was academically disqualified when my son was diagnosed with cerebral palsy. I went through depression. Uh, but at the end of the day, I, I overcame all those obstacles and I was the commencement speaker for my graduation ceremony. And then I obtained my master's degree and now I'm planning to go for my PhD. Wow. That's, that's unbelievable. So, so when you were, um, made to sleep outside because the father of your child made you and your son sleep outside. You weren't even living in, in San Diego or, or, or in San Diego County at that time. So you had, you were kind of out by yourself. And, and, uh, and I remember you told me that it was also something your son said that got you to go back to school and continue your, ed your education. Yes. I was living in Fresno, California. Um, when I was a freshman, I dropped out of high school and I moved to Fresno with my baby's father. And yeah, he forced us to sleep outside the house. That's why I decided to go back to school. But then when my son was diagnosed with cerebral palsy, I went through depression. I then was academically disqualified from Cal State San Marcos. And I wasn't planning to go back, but one morning when I was getting my son ready for school, he asked me, mommy, do you have a career already? Remember that every day you used to say that one day you were going to have a career, that we were going to have a house and a dog. And that was the first time that I heard my son speak in a clear sentence. I was so happy that that day, instead of going to work, I went to school. I went to Cal State San Marcos and I asked them how I could go back up I asked them what were the requirements for me to go back to that school. And even though that it took me six years to get my bachelor's degree, at the end of the day, uh, the girl who was academically disqualified from Cal State San Marcos became the commencement speaker for her graduation ceremony. And that was the first time that my story became a local news back in 2017. 
and I never, I, I, I never thought that two years later I was gonna get my master's degree, and then that my pictures were gonna go viral and my story was gonna go viral. <laughs> It's, yeah, it's it's unbelievable. So you you're a, a, a victim of that terrible uh, domestic violence, which is horrific. You have a, a son that's ill. Um, you're uh, you know you're you're very young, and 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 finally you come back home. You go back to school. You graduate from Cal State San Marcos, mm -hmm. which is a great school. That's where my nephew also graduated from. I think you met him at the House of Mexico dinner. And yeah. then you go to uh, San Diego State University for your master's. That's an uh, that's a, an, an incredible story, and I remember I we were talking about, I think we were at Nacho Libre or one of those places having uh, uh, a, a, something, something to, to eat, and we talked about it, it's it's a movie, it's a book, and and you said yeah I'm, I'm thinking about it, so you are actually working on a book, and and that's fantastic. But before we talk about that, I know you've been invited to speak to different places. I think when I when when you were going to be going to Atlanta back then or something like that. So you've been invited to speak. It must be very inspiring for the people that you're speaking to because they're almost your same age. Yes, I. Be, yes, I was invited to speak at 20 different places. I traveled to Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, I was also scheduled to travel to Omaha, Nebraska, and 20 other places. Uh, I, I've been speaking to students virtually as well, and I've been sharing my story at different places, uh, like Casa de Mexico and other organizations and it is it is amazing when i when i have the opportunity to speak to students that are my age or younger than me because somehow they they get in, they get inspired by my story because they can relate to my story or they can see themselves in me it's like if i go to a middle school and i speak to students that don't know how to speak english and I tell them I was there once, and and now if I was able to make it all the way to uh, high, if I was able to make it through higher education, you can also do it. And they believe me because they know that I was there, that I was in their shoes, and they can see themselves in me. It's very inspiring. They can relate. And and I was really shocked when you told me that you were involved in Toastmasters. And the reason I was shocked, I was going, you should be teaching them. Because Toastmasters, of course, learning how to speak and all that. I'm going, you're an expert. So I think you were even the vice president of Toastmasters. Is that correct? Uh, yes, that is correct. I've been a member of Toastmasters for the last four years. And to be honest, when I, I, I am very grateful with Toastmasters because when I joined, I, the reason why I decided to join Toastmasters is because I wanted to confront my fear of public speaking. I, I was so afraid of speaking in front of a classroom and if I wanted to help or inspire someone or share my story, I had to learn how to speak in front of a public. And thanks to Toastmasters, I was able to confront my fear of public speaking and now I am the vice president of the club. I am the one that is in charge of organizing uh, every meeting. And I, I learn a lot. There's always, there's, I, I learn a lot from my, from, from other members. And I, I am very grateful with Toastmasters. I, I don't know, like it's, I, I recently, I was in the front cover of the Toastmasters magazine, which is a international magazine that it's, share all over the world and wow. knowing that once upon a time when I joined his masters I, I was extremely shy I wasn't planning to be there because it was very intimidating to be the only Mexican girl there the youngest one and all the people all the members in the club were business owners um, white American and honestly I, I thought that I wanted to just quit or, or not join but I I learned that in order to grow, you have to put yourself, you have to get out of your comfort zone. And I am happy that I didn't, that I didn't leave the club and that I'm still there. And I'm actually planning to create the first bilingual Toastmasters here in North County, uh, because I think that is very important that other Latinos, that other Mexicanos learn how to speak in public, because there's a lot of, there's a lot of stories like mine. There's a lot of people that have a lot to share in, it is something that I noticed that is not in our 
like not a lot of Latinos are in communication clubs. And I, I think that it's very important that more Latinos are in communication clubs so that they can they can share what they have. Absolutely. And I think that's a great idea about the Spanish uh, Toastmasters. Speaking of Spanish, how about saying a few words in Spanish about the importance of education y, y la importancia de continuar con tu educación para tener una mejor vida. Lo import, la importancia de educación. Claro que sí. Español es mi primer lenguaje y siento, yo pienso que me comunico mejor en español. La importancia de obtener una buena educación es que te abres las puertas a mejores oportunidades, que siempre tienes más opciones y una educación nadie te lo quita. Es algo que se queda contigo para siempre y es por eso que siempre yo trato de motivar o impulsar a otros estudiantes a que continúen con su educación porque es algo que siempre vas a tener contigo toda la vida. Es algo que... Uh, Que, que tú tienes la oportunidad, que nosotros los muchachos jóvenes tenemos la oportunidad de adquirir. Uh, muchas personas a veces no creemos que es posible, pero yo quiero que sepan que sí lo es, que si tú te propones a obtener una buena educación, lo puedes lograr y que siempre hay recursos para que lo logres. Y lo más importante es de que tú puedas ser una buena representación para tus hermanos, para las personas de que son más jóvenes que tú, que miren que sí es posible. No, yo pienso que no deberíamos de conformarnos y que siempre, ya sea en la educación o en otras áreas, siempre hay que tratar de mejorarnos y de tratar de alcanzar algo más alto. Y hay que siempre acordarnos que nuestros padres, todos los sacrificios que hicieron para nosotros, para que nosotros tengamos una mejor vida. Y nosotros tenemos que hacer esto para nuestros hijos. Exactamente, y eso es eso es lo más importante, porque nuestros padres vinieron acá con el sueño de darnos una mejor vida. Los sacrificios que ellos hicieron son sacrificios tan grandes que nosotros no tuvimos que pasar. Y lo mejor que podemos hacer para ellos es cumplirles, cumplirles el sueño y que ellos miren que sus sacrificios sí valieron la pena. Porque si no hubiera sido por mis papás, yo no estuviera aquí. Si no hubiera sido por... Uh, los sacrificios de mis padres, yo nunca hubiera obtenido, obtenido la educación que obtuve, así que esto se lo debo yo a ellos y por eso estoy infinitamente agradecida con ellos. Yes, well said. So the importance of education and and the fact that our parents have made all these sacrifices for us to to have a better life. So you mentioned Erika Erika Alfaro that that uh, you're working on a book. So so how's that coming along? How, how do you write a book? How, how does that work? <laughs> yeah. I am working on my first book. It will be uh, my biography. And since I, I've always been this type of girl that carries a journal with her, I always write in my journal. And I have a lot of, uh, I haven't shared a lot of uh, uh, things about my life that I would like to share in the book. Um, for example, when I decided to go back to school in Fresno, California, I my parents were living in Tijuana, Mexico, so I remember that I was in search of uh, high school. And when I went to the, to, to the school, they told me, oh, your parents need to sign the form if you want to enroll. And I remember that I there, there was a stranger outside the, the office and I begged her, like, le supliqué, and I asked her if she could tell the receptionist that she was my mother. And I was crying and that, telling her that I, that I wanted a better life. And she agreed to sign the paperwork and have the meeting with the principal. Uh, I didn't even know her. I, 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 don't, I don't even remember how she looks. But those are like the type of scenes that, that I have in my mind and I, that I think that are very important to share because there's, like I said, there's a lot of people that can relate with my story. And I just, I just always think back to the girl, the 16 year old girl, Erica, the young Erica that was always in search of a story like mine to see if it was possible. And I know that if I share my story and if I write the book, one day a student or a teenage mother will read it and they'll see that they can also do it. And I, I always, I'm, I'm like, I always write for one hour every morning and I, I have my book draft. Se va a llamar cosechando sueños, harvesting dreams. And oh, that's beautiful. I am planning to publish the book next year because 
there's a lot of things that I want to do and I really I want to publish the book once I'm accepted for the PhD program so that I can end the book in a in a nice way like that um, but there's there's a lot of things that I haven't shared and I would like to share it in the book well that story of that woman that stranger that helped you along that's mm -hmm. an example of the fact that life is beautiful and that yes. most people in the world are good and you got to bring that out in, in them and and uh, that's the spirit. That's the human spirit. That's the human condition. And even if we're living in these dark times like we are now with the virus and with certain people giving messages of hate, et cetera, we always need to remember that there's always a rainbow after the storm. And you've had that, that rainbow several times in your life, and you're continuing to have it. Now, I when I saw you the last time, mm -hmm. we were at a, a, a community festival uh, for different Latino countries and Latino heritage and so on and so forth. And you were next to the our House of Mexico booth and you were selling jewelry, beautiful jewelry. So tell us about that. Yes. Um, I started my jewelry business last year. Uh, and the reason why I started the business is because I wanted to give scholarships to students. And the idea started with five rings. Um, right now, I don't know how many rings I have. Uh, I have thousands of rings and I have 10 people selling my jewelry. I'm planning to reach wow. out to stores. And yes, when, when I saw you in that festival, I was selling the rings, but I no longer sell them. I have people selling them for me and I'm planning to grow the business. I will grow the business. That is my goal to sell it in catalogs, uh, online, uh, other social media platforms, but mainly having other people selling the jewelry uh, so that they can make a commission out of it. And at the same time, I can make extra money to for scholarships or also uh, for the project of writing my book. And yes, that's, that's what I have, Janelle's jewelry. Well, that's fantastic. Maybe, maybe Sarah, my boss, will allow us to sell it on the Gente Unida uh, platform. So yeah. we got to... Be nice to Sarah, so maybe Sarah will allow us to, to do that. that. I think that would be wonderful. That would that be wonderful. Be and, <laughs> and no, that, that'll be that'll be great because you're doing so many things. I have no doubt you're going to be successful in whatever you decide to do. And and as far as Oaxaca, which is a, a very special place in my heart, and I love Oaxaca very much, and I know there's a large Oaxacan uh, population here in San Diego, and just a couple of days ago, Tomas, who's a friend of mine that I met maybe 20 years ago or so, he does not speak Spanish. He only speaks Mixteco okay. and English. So it's really unusual for me <laughs> when him and I have been together in, in front of a group of, of uh, migrants, and him and I, in front of the group of migrants, are speaking in English. <laughs> and so it's very uncomfortable for me because, because he doesn't speak uh, Spanish, so there's no way for us to speak in Spanish, and uh, and he's and he's always talking about Oaxaca and giving back to Oaxaca, and he's a great example of a human being. He often makes donations. Like I remember one time he he gave me a bunch of fried chicken to take to the the people in the canyons, or he had clothes because he's a tailor. He's a tailor, so a lot of times people don't pick up the clothes that you know that he's worked on and so forth. So that spirit of giving is something very important, and there's a special magic in the people from Oaxaca. It's a very special place. Yes. Oaxaca. Do you have the opportunity to go there very much? Yeah, I was actually in Oaxaca uh, five months ago. No, I was in Oaxaca six months ago. And I went to visit my parents also. Um, there's a short film uh, from Cronicas de Univision that shares my story. And the crew travel all the way to Oaxaca to interview my parents. And that was an excuse for me to travel to Oaxaca six months ago. Oaxaca is beautiful. All the people, uh, Oaxaca, if you, if you ever go to Oaxaca, like for example, my parents, where my parents live, as soon as they see that someone arrived to, to the Pueblo, they, there's a lot of people knocking on your door, like they prepare fresh food for you because they know that you're a new arrival. And I think that's something beautiful from Oaxaca. Or if they see that you're um, like making a party, everyone joins to help without even without you even asking. And that's that's the type of spirit that Oaxacanos have. 
they love to help their community. They love to like uh, volunteer help or they're such a hard worker people. My mom, my mom, mom and my dad are son las personas más trabajadoras que he conocido en toda mi vida. And other people from Oaxaca are like that. And I don't know if it's uh, la cultura de ellos. I, I don't know what is it, but I, I am very proud that my parents are from Oaxaca. And siempre que me preguntan, I always say that I'm from Oaxaca. But yeah, I have been in Oaxaca and I'm actually planning to go again. Hopefully this year or next, uh, but Oaxaca is so beautiful and the food is uh, like, está deliciosa. <laughs> I'm getting hungry right now for that mole and, and, uh, and, and then the, just the wonderful spirit of Oaxaca. I've had an opportunity to go there several times and I know a lot of people from Oaxaca. One of them is a dear friend of mine, uh, Dr. Cristoria Wellen. She's a psychologist and she and her husband, Michael, go down there regularly and they work with the, a lot of the children and, and making sure that they can go to school. And, and there's just so many people that want to help. And if you ever go to Oaxaca, you're going to fall in love with Oaxaca. Oh, it's yeah. a beautiful, beautiful uh, part of the world and, and, and wonderful people. So you got the, uh, the book project. You got your jewelry. You're, you're speaking. You're mm-hmm. going to get your doctorate. Do you know yeah. what you're going to get your doctorate in and where you plan to apply for your doctorate? Yeah, I am planning to apply at San Diego State University, and I want to get the doctorate in educational leadership. In educational leadership. And you told me something about, because of your son's disabilities, that I think you're doing something with that, uh, edu- with, with work in that field as well? Yes, I was working as a behavioral consultant for uh, kids that have autism, uh, cerebral policy, and I was helping the Latino community. I was helping their parents with their kids, especially those parents that uh, they barely got the diagnosis of their kid. I was visiting them at home and uh, working as a behavior consultant, as a therapist. And that was, I was working full time, but then I decided to focus entirely in my business. And that is that is something that, I, that I'm planning to do. I'm actually planning to start a YouTube channel so that I can help uh, people in my community because after the pictures went viral and after I share my story, a lot of people are always asking me, how did you overcome depression? How did you deal with the, uh, the fact that you went through do- domestic abuse? And a lot of people have been asking me a lot of questions and I really wish I could answer all of those questions, but uh, to be realistic, I cannot answer thousands and thousands of messages, but I try my best. <laughs> And I, I've been telling myself, maybe if we start a YouTube channel or a blog, um, that, that is something that I'm planning to do because I have a master's in education with a concentration in counseling. And I think that, I could, that is something that I, maybe I can do for free for my community as well. You know, that's a great idea. Not too long ago, I know nothing about social media. I mean, if it wasn't for Sarah, I would not know how to do these podcasts. <laughs> But but I know there was a woman, she may be mm-hmm. from Oaxaca, and she kind of became a YouTube a sensation, and she comes out and she just talks about cooking. And she says, oh, this is the way I make this, this is the way I make that. So I could see you doing that, you know, t- talking about, uh, you know, some of your experiences, how you've overcome yeah. this, how you've, you've uh, overcome that, uh, because you're, you're, um, people know your passion, you know, they'll learn about your story, They'll see your, you know, they'll feel your, your, uh, uh, the vibrations of love and, and of triumph, even though you've had all these challenges where a lot of people would give up, and you didn't. Yeah. And a lot of that comes from your parents, your parents, mm-hmm. your grandparents, your roots, and the fact that you have taken uh, their love and their energy and that uh, those seeds that have been planted and put them to fruition. So I think that's a great idea you have about that YouTube uh, channel coming out and speaking. Do you speak any Mixteco? Yes, I know how to speak Mixteco. I understand Mixteco. It, my Mixteco is not per- perfect cuando lo hablo, but I understand everything. And uh, I really wish I could speak it uh, fluently, but I can, I can say the basic things. I, I can speak a couple of sentences, but I understand everything. I used to have a radio show a long time ago and it was called Morones por la Tarde. And, uh, and I had a, a friend of mine that's from Oaxaca, and she mm-hmm. would come on my show every couple of weeks and so forth. And I used to ask her, that's something I'm going to ask you, if, if you wouldn't mind. 
just to say uh -huh. a few things in Misteco, maybe say something in Misteco, like, and this will be the first time on Magnificent Mujer that we have somebody speak in Misteco, and maybe you could just say something like, uh, you know, a message of love or something, uh, or some sort of a greeting in, in the beautiful language that is Misteco. Yeah, of course. There's actually a beautiful phrase that I would like to say. Uh, let me let me just make sure that I'm saying it correctly. But it means just give me a sec. And it's a beautiful language. And one of the things that people don't realize, like with a lot of the native languages in, in the Americas, is that these languages have no nothing to do with with the language. For example, here of English or the language in Mexico of Spanish, they have absolutely nothing to do with that. It's, it's it's its own language, and it's a language that's existed before Spanish was ever spoken on on these continents. So yeah. yeah so once you gather your your thoughts there, yeah, just some sort of a message in Misteco would be wonderful. Yeah, and it's it's actually a beautiful message. <laughs> I'm just like trying to make sure that I'm saying it correctly, but I do. Let me go ahead and just give me a second because I even wrote it down for. Yeah, so so take your time on that, and then don't forget that at the end, because we're coming to the end, we want some of those links so we could find out about how we could find out information about the photographer, how we could find out information about you in case a school wants you to come and speak or a group wants to hire you to speak, you know, those types of things. We're going to want those, your jewelry, you know, your jewelry, how can people buy your jewelry, and, and so on and so forth. So did you find the uh, the, the the information yes, you were looking for? I have it, yes. Let me go ahead and say okay. it. And of course, I'll be sharing all the links. Um, and this is, this. okay, I'm going to go ahead and say it. Iana Sanyi Kahi Kindu Andisia. And that means dreams do come true. Oh, that's perfect. How do you say it again? Iana Sanyi Kahi Kindu Andisia. I wish I could speak uh, Mixteco. I'm, I'm trying <laughs> to learn uh, how to speak French. I studied <laughs> French when I was in high school and, and in college, and I could say one or two things, you know, just enough to get me into trouble. Uh, but but Mixteco, uh, I always thought Mixteco would be such a wonderful language. And when I've been with the community, because I still see a lot of them in the North County where there's a large concentration, I always uh -huh. thought it would be wonderful that I could, if I could surprise them one day and actually speak in Misteco. There's a church. There's uh -huh. a Catholic church in North County where once a month, I believe it was, they would have the mass in Misteco. Oh, and I would wow. go to that. It was it was fantastic because there were some words that there was no Misteco word for it. Just like there's some yeah. words in lots of languages that there's no word. So they'll use the you know, the one like uh, uh you know, like all of a sudden they'd be saying something in Misteco and then mm -hmm. all of a sudden there'd be a word in Spanish. Because there was no word, no no translation for that word, uh, but it, yeah. it is a beautiful, yeah, beautiful language. Yeah. So as far as be, people being able to being able to get a hold of you, you know, if somebody wants to get a hold of you because they want you to do a virtual presentation or an in person presentation, which will be happening again soon, God willing, uh, or to find out about the photographer or your jewelry, maybe you could give us some of those links so we could put them on our website. Yeah, of course. Yeah, uh, like I said, my business is Janelle's Jewelry, and the Instagram account is also Janelle's Jewelry. Um, how do you spell Jan How do you spell Janelle? Janelle is J E N E L Jewelry all together. That is my Instagram account, and my personal account is Alfaro Erica forty seven. And if someone wants me to, to speak to, to their students or a conference, my email address is alfaroerica47 at gmail.com. Because I strongly recommend it. I've seen you in action. I've seen your jewelry. I've, I've heard you speak. I've gotten to know you. And, uh, and you're a very, you're a definitely a magnificent mujer. And if we can get that other magnificent mujer, that's the, the uh, producer, maybe we can get your jewelry on the websites because we've got magnificentmujer.org, we've got gentonita.net, we've got gentonita.shop, and uh, that'd be wonderful. So hopefully my boss, Sarah, will allow that to happen. We'll, we'll find out about that. She's probably going to get mad at me that I mentioned <laughs> it, but hopefully we'll be able to get that done. Well, Erica, yeah, uh, thank you. 
I'm sorry, go ahead. Oh, thank you, Enrique, yeah. And like I said, I started the business with the idea of paying it forward, and I am willing to donate 30% of the profits of every jewelry for any any of the, any use that you're like, if an organization wants to reach out to me um, for donations, I usually donate. Right now it's not a big amount, but in the future, I, I hope I can write big checks for for other nonprofit organizations. Well, that's very generous. You know, with the work that we're doing with Gente Unida and and uh, the the needs that are, that uh, that we have right now with the virus, about making sure people have, you know, they, that they adhere to uh, social distancing, wearing the masks, taking yeah. care of themselves, et cetera. It's very very important, and um, and that's why there is a lot of good organizations out there that, that are doing great work. One of the mm-hmm. the things that we focus on with Gente Unida, and, and I know you have a lot of interest in this as well is the migrant children, working with the children at the shelters in Tijuana and Mexicali. We also have a connection with the shelter in Guadalajara. And we're going to be going down to another beautiful part in Mexico to have a presence, and that's Chiapas. We were, we were going to be working with a shelter down in Chiapas, which, also, which is also a magical place. Uh, and we would love to do more work in, in Oaxaca or, or you know, have more of a presence. So that's something that we can talk about later, be, later because as a member of the board, Maybe that's something that you could hook us up with. Uh, we already have a good in there with our friend Cristoria Welland, and maybe you two have got to meet you and Cristoria. Uh, she's a wonderful woman. She's Canadian, Canadian, habla español, and she probably knows how to say a few things in Misteco as well because uh, <laughs> she's with with the community so much. Oh, okay. So, yeah. Erica, um, mm-hmm. one of the things that I always like to ask my guest is for me to tell me, when I say, what is love? What is love to Erika Alfaro? What would you say love is? I'll say that love is having respect for other people. And always, siempre, siempre estar dispuesto a ayudar sin esperar nada a cambio. I, I think that is love. Your actions and all so your be, being able, Yeah, being able to, to, like you said in Spanish, to help without asking for something in return. And that's something that you've always done. And I was also very impressed to meet your husband. What, what a nice young man. He joined us at the dinner for the House of Mexico. So, Erika Alfaro, este, mucho gusto en, en, en escucharte de nuevo. Give my love to your parents. I really want to meet your parents. I haven't had a chance to, to meet your parents, although there's a slight chance that we may be met when I was doing my work up in Carlsbad a long time ago. But definitely, I would like to meet them uh, to tell them how proud I am to have met you and what a wonderful job they did to prepare you in this journey called life. Thank you so much, Enrique. And like, and like you said, I'm pretty sure you met my father. He was he was in those fields where you initiated your community service. And I am very grateful for this opportunity. And uh, I, I, you are a person that I admire so much. He siempre cuando crece quiero ser como tú. Uh, seguir ayudando a la comunidad en, like you said, like, like, ayudar sin esperar nada cambio y quiero ayudar con, con acciones y, y no con palabras y I, yo prometo que trabajaré bien duro para poder seguir ayudando a mi comunidad. Muchísimas gracias, Erika. So thank you very much, Erika. Make sure that you uh, tune in every Tuesday for Magnificent mm-hmm. Mujer or Buen Hombre. And uh, it, we had a very special guest today who's Erika Alfaro, somebody that I admire. Uh, a lot and uh, it's wonderful to know you you're one of my heroes and you're a magnificent mujer muchísimas gracias and don't forget that love is an action not just the word so on behalf of our producer uh, Sarah Bella and your host Enrique Morones muchas gracias and don't forget vote in November of this year gracias gracias